So welcome. Thank you for coming. This is Bitcoin and blockchains or cryptocurrency and blockchains. <clears throat> I use Bitcoin here because that is the most recognizable cryptocurrency that is on the market today. And blockchains will be going into the overview of both of Bitcoin, which you can assume also co correlates to the other cryptocurrencies also on the market in terms of what we'll be talking about. A little introductions, I'm Sean Godfrey. I've worked for Chateau for over 20 years, uh, worked in maintenance, came through, went to school, and now I am a computer nerd, geek, whatever you want to call me. I'm the VP of IT. With me, I have uh, Mitchell. He's up in one of our remote sites up in Linwood, uh, streaming this to our residents up there. Down in Renton at Chateau Valley Center, we have Todd Cachaggio, our life enrichment assistant down there streaming to their residents. And in the back here, we have Kenji, our digital marketing manager, who is our producer and will help out with me and this slide presentation to stream everywhere. A little housekeeping and disclaimers before we get started. This is not a financial recommendation session. I will not tell you what cryptocurrencies to buy, what software to purchase, nothing like that, because I'm just explaining what this is, um, the uh, history of it. Um, and then we'll get into some more details in terms of ledgers versus the blockchain, what the differences are between those two. Uh, along with uh, what is a fiat currency compared to a Bitcoin currency. Uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap it all up with a conclusion and kind of future cases and possibly have a discussion on what the future holds and uh, ideas that you guys might have on the future of cryptocurrencies and blockchains. So in our overview here, Bitcoin is a system that enables users to transact with one another directly without having to have a middleman or a banking institution that will pinch pennies and other sorts of other fees that they can apply to transactions. Um, Bitcoin is a cryptographically secure, meaning that it is encrypted. Your data cannot be leaked out from that block of information. You have to have a key to unlock that information. Um, and not everyone has a key to a block. <clears throat> Your blockchain technology is the underlying technology or is the underlying framework. I guess you could say of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, <clears throat> uh, which is a decentralized ledger that stores the data in blocks. And we will cover that in a few slides. So for the history, we are unsure of exactly who this person or persons are. Uh, Nakamoto, is the name that is written in the white paper that was published back in 2008. And in that white paper, they outlined how the technology underlying blo uh, the blockchains work and how Bitcoin can be utilized on top of that technology. Um, you, Nakamoto was the very first one to put a block on the internet. <clears throat> he or she or they have this statue representing them. This is in Budapest. <laughs> Found that. I did not know that Budapest was big into Bitcoin, but apparently they are. Uh, Nagamoto also was uh, said to be from Japan. 
Uh, my personal feelings differ from that. I believe it was a group of females from the Hong Kong, China air area that came up with this idea and published it under this pseudo name. We, like I said, we don't know for sure who this is. This is my idea is it was a bunch of females that came up with it. And because of the communist state of China, the females were not looked upon as equals as men. And so that's why they published it under a man's name and Japanese, in fact, just to distance themselves from this. The reason why I have that speculation will be coming here soon. Nakamoto released the first version 0.1 of Bitcoin software on what a platform that services other software called SourceForge. I've used SourceForge in the past uh, for little off projects that I have, little goldfish that swim across computer screens that I want to play a practical joke on one of my coworkers. They get back to their computer and they have a fishbowl all of a sudden for a computer screen. So lots of little things like that that get published on SourceForge. So that's where they uh, published it, the actual software. And then they created the Genesis block of Bitcoin, block number zero. To solve a block, it needs a lot of computer power. And each block then also, uh, you get a reward for solving a puzzle. This block, he offered 50 Bitcoins at the time was probably less than a penny. Today, if you offer 50 Bitcoins, it's $1.2 million. And that is just over a 12, well, almost 15 years, I would say then, right? Because 2008 to 2023 is a 15 year period. So within 15 years, it goes from less than a penny for 50 all the way up to $1.2 million. That's freaking crazy, if you ask me. This is the actual Genesis block. This is what a block of data in the blockchain looks like. If you notice over here on the right hand side, it says, the Times, 03, January 2009. Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. Chancellor, that is a British term for someone important, I take it. <laughs> At least I've been told. But the, Brit uh, the Times, I know, is a British uh, newspaper. And so this is talking to on the Times on January 3rd, 2009, there was an article about the British Chancellor doing a bailout for the banks. And this Genesis block was brought to you by this pseudo person. These will be our all time highs for Bitcoin. So over the years from 2008, from that Genesis block, all the way to today, we've had many, many all time highs. And as they go through, I, uh, I, I pulled out a handful of them for us to look at, just so you can understand kind of what happens in the world actually affects Bitcoin. So in 2013, Bitcoin broke over a hundred dollar mark per coin. So that first Genesis block, whoever got that 50 Bitcoins now has 5,000, right? Is that my math? Um, the reason why you saw this increase is speculation, obviously. I'm not saying that this is the true force behind these numbers, but these are all speculations of why the numbers went up. And it is because the Bank of Cyprus, one of the Cyprus is over in the Mediterranean, and their main bank or one of their main banks decided to, hey, I'm closing shop. 
they went into a financial crisis. They stopped taking it. And depositors' funds were taken from their bank. So I had $100,000 in my Cypress bank accounts. I now have zero dollars. There's nothing you can do about it because who printed that money? Cypress printed that money. They have the right to their money so they can take it back. <clears throat> so that's where Bitcoin came into effect. People saw it as a safe haven. It's not tied to that government, that money. And so it is a safer asset for the people in Cyprus at that time to invest and make these on, you can almost think of them as online bank accounts then. <clears throat> the next one here in 2013, uh, after the summer of all of this, the news got a hold of Bitcoin and blockchains and made a big hoorah about it. Look at the next banking thing that's coming down the road for us, you know, going off of the gold standard and going into uh, fractal banking systems. And this is a whole nother separate banking system altogether. So this is a third option. I'm sure there's more out there, but this is actually a third option. And people were afraid of missing out on this opportunity. Shoot, I was. I mean, back in 2003, I was eyeball dip deep in diapers and baby formula. So I had no extra cash on hand to actually do any investing at that time. I wish I did, but I had Irish twins, which is my kids are just about a year apart from one another. And that's a financial crisis all on my own, right? <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> that's what fueled this the second all-time high that broke over the thousand dollar mark. So within one summer, you jump up a hundred percent. Right? And once again, my math is not possibly right, but These are the other two notable highs that I uh, earmarked for us to look at. We have December of 2017. So this initial coin offerings right here, what this is is all those other coins, cryptocurrencies on the market. So when a new cryptocurrency would come out, they'd be like, you can buy 100 cryptocurrencies for 10 bucks. That's the initial coin offering. And so all these new cryptocurrencies, everyone's like Bitcoin's taken off and everyone's loving it. You can almost see as these other cryptocurrencies as different governments issuing their own different currencies. These are different companies now issuing their different currencies using the same technology, back end technology of the blockchain. <clears throat> so that's where this all-time high was there was because everyone wanted to get into this initial coin offerings. And when you do that, I might as well buy some other Bitcoins over here and buy this stuff and diversify my cryptocurrencies, right? Just like your stocks nowadays, you probably want to diversify. You not have all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. So that's the speculation there is that it was all because of that rally of the initial coin offerings. And, you know, we, we've had in recent months, you know, um, cryptocurrencies actually collapsing on themselves. FTX, for example, is a great one. Great example of a cryptocurrency that just went kaput altogether. That whole marketplace just did not work out. Probably because of fraud on that owners and unfortunately. Well, he was living in the Caymans or something, I want to say. Anyways, this last all-time high I want to speak to, uh, it's close to what the all-time high is right here. You can see it was actually in November 21st of 2021, or somewhere in November of 2021 was actually about the 65,000 mark. And that's the all all time high, meaning it has not gone above that mark. But this one right here, I wanted to show to you because of Elon Musk. 
Now, Elon Musk has a big interest in cryptocurrencies online. He's very techy. He loves being on the bleeding edge of technology with everything he does. Cryptocurrency is one of those things. So he went out and bought $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin. After he did that, he said, okay, now that I have all this Bitcoin, I'm going to accept Bitcoin as currency to purchase a Tesla, one of my automobiles that they, he makes. Once he did that, he found out that Bitcoin has these massive servers and uh, workstations that are crunching numbers, equations, that sort of thing. And it's not that eco-friendly, you could say. Subsequent, it matters what kind of documentations you're looking at and who you talk to. Some people say that cryptocurrency is actually greener than your standard issue dollar bills that you get from the grocery store. There, there's both sides of the coin. <laughs> I don't mind the pun. But <clears throat> the end result was he then said, after a month of accepting it, no, I'm not going to accept any more cryptocurrency for Teslas. And that's where it plunged again. Down here is where he said, I will no longer accept it. After he said that, you can see that it kind of bottomed out for a couple of months here and then shot right back up, it looks like. He still owns $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin today, even though he says it's not green, it's not friendly. The, it's one of those things that, you know, do what I say, not what I do type of things, I feel, with Elon Musk, right? <clears throat> but anyways, it also goes to show Twitter. I mean, he, he says one or two things on, on uh, in a tweet, and the stocks, so to speak, the Bitcoin value decreases just because someone says something. It's not based upon any kind of war or anything geopolitical. Out. It's just because someone said something about it. You know, like sticks and stones may break my bones, but it could crash the Bitcoin market. So now that we've seen the, the all-time highs and some variances inside of the ups and downs of the cryptocurrency, specifically Bitcoin, I wanted to get into kind of the differences. And this is one of the differences that is a major hurdle for a lot of people. I know it was a major hurdle for me to understand what the differences between a ledger and a blockchain is. So to start, a ledger for me was my checkbook. Right? Like you have, I wrote this check. This is my running balance on the side, debits and credits, that sort of thing. Hence this picture over here, right? You used to have blue pens for debits and I believe red pens for credits and that sort of thing. The unfortunate thing is these are maintained by a single entity, whether that is the business themselves or it is a banking institution themselves. It can be just a pad of paper on someone's desk, like you see here in this picture. That is a ledger. <clears throat> Not very secure, especially if it's in pencil. I can go in and erase it. And put so different numbers in there or use whiteout back in the day and make it different. It's not centralized either, right? Or it is centralized, I mean. It, it is sitting there on their desk, right? And lastly, you know, like I just said, you know, it, it's vulnerable to being manipulated and for fraud and um, unless someone, like a third party is checking on your ledgers and making sure that your accountants are doing what they're saying they're doing right and not skimming off the top and stuff like that, which happens a lot too on ledgers. <clears throat> you wouldn't know unless you really dug in or understood what your ledger is. And so it was a it's, it's a big hurdle for a lot of people to 
even sit down with a financial ledger and understand them. So I had to understand them first in order to talk about the blockchain ledger, so to speak. So your blockchain, it is a decentralized and it's maintained by a network of computers, which are called nodes. And this technology was adopted and essentially standardized, you could say in a way, back in 2016, how blockchains work. <clears throat> I don't know if IEEE got involved or who exactly was it, but it is now called a distributed ledger technology, DLT, is what a blockchain is. <clears throat> it is secured, and like I said, it stores the data in an uh, encryption capsule. <clears throat> the only key that has it is if you have that key or the computer has that key, right? It's going to be safe from prying eyes. It's not like someone can walk past your desk and see your financial ledger sitting on your desk, right? Here, no one can just walk by and see your ledger any longer. It's reliable because it has more than just one computer doing this for us, right? Like It's a multitude across the globe network. It's not just in the U.S. either. It is global, people. This is where the checks and balances for a blockchain get into, um, it's, it's just distributed. <laughs> and the last thing, I, I got hung up on this immutable in my mind. When I think of immutable, I think of muting the TV, right? Immutable here means that <clears throat> once it's written, once the data gets accepted into one of these blocks, you cannot undo it. It is written permanently in there. And that has to do with the cryptography also. Because it's encrypted, you cannot change that data. Because once you change the data inside of it, the encryption breaks, essentially. And that block of data is no longer uh, accepted in the blockchain. So once the block is written, it is permanent. It is like the hieroglyphics sitting in an Egyptian pyramid. Just digital. Before I move on, I want to also mention here in this visualization of it, you can see these little tails going from one to the other. What this is, is each block are interconnected with one another. So as a new block comes in to the computers to digest and verify that the data integrity is consistent with the rest of it, it piggybacks from the previous block. So it'd be like the last sentence of a paragraph is repeated in the next paragraph, right? To reestablish that it is linked in that way. And that's where those little tails come from on here. Now, the, the, the computers that do this, like I said, there's massive, huge, sprawling data centers that like Microsoft and Google and all these other companies have out there. And you can rent computer space from them. And a lot of people do. And what they do with those computer spaces is they do these transactions of linking these together. It's all mathematical equations and you get... Um, perks, so to speak, you get dividends, I guess would be a better way of saying it. You get dividends for your computer processor. So as you process more and more of these, you you get a, um, I forget what they call them, dang it. You, you get perks, more or less. You, you get a kickback from the actual Bitcoin people that you process this chain and now you have 0 0.0001 bitcoins or something <laughs> we'll get into now the fiat currency versus the bitcoin currencies so a fiat currency when i hear it i think of the car 
My sister drives a Fiat, or at least she used to, unless she bought a new one. <clears throat> Pretty cool little cars. But a fiat currency is established by governments, right? So they're printed, distributed, and they are reg regulated by that said government. The banks are governed by that government at that time. Banks get taxed just like us. They, um, you know, the fiat, the fiat currencies, it's the government wants more money. I'll just print more dollars. Well, that goes into inflation or whatever. I mean, I, like I said, I'm not a banker. I've done research in this, but I'm, I'm not a banker. But from what I understand, you print more money, inflation starts taking off. And you don't want that for the most part, right? <clears throat> and likewise, if a government owns that currency, you put your money into a bank account. Let's say you have $2 million. You put that into a Wells Fargo bank account. Because it's fiat currency, the government can turn around and take your money away from you. But you didn't know that all the way. But they're only on the hook for $100,000 the FDIC insurance. Wells Fargo could all of a sudden poof disappear. Your $2 million disappear with it and the federal government will only give you $100,000 back. <clears throat> the, uh, there's many other issues with fiat currency. I mean, you, you go into fractal brain banking or if it's based off the gold standard, that sort of type of conversations. I don't want to get too much into that. I have my own personal theories on that, but it is the fiat is kind of old technology that the Romans used to use, right? I think it's a little, I think we should uh, kind of make it more modern mo money. Hence Bitcoins now. So Bitcoin is not associated with a government agency. So how the heck can the U.S. government or any other government agency turn around and say, I'm going to tax you on the gains you've made in Bitcoin? Legally, they have a right because you're here in the U.S. But really, do they? I don't know. I mean, that's kind of a question I have in my head. <clears throat> because it's not a government issue or... You're not storing it in a bank that is insured by a federal government. Yes, it can go away at a blink of an eye, but so can your Wells Fargo money. But if the United States collapses or Cyprus, let's say, collapses, their currency collapses, all your money is out the door anyways, right, for that fiat currency. Where, if it's in Bitcoin, it is a global actual currency. And so you did see that, you know, it rises and falls, but it probably won't disappear altogether anymore now because so many people around the world are now using it. So it is not a government or a banking institution backed currency. So there is nobody there pinching your dollars as you make transactions back and forth. Yeah, I, I was actually asked, you know, hey, Sean, there was uh, the anonymity is people will know what I buy online if I use Bitcoin. No, they, they'll know that person one, two, three, four, X, Y, Z purchased it, but it's not associated with your name. Just like today, you can go to the store, pull out a dollar bill, buy a pack of gum with that dollar bill. They don't need to know your personal information. Here's a dollar bill, right? Same with Bitcoin. They don't need to know my personal information. My digital wallet, here you go. Here's my Bitcoin that will be transferred to theirs, all they see is it's person one, two, three, X, Y, Z. They don't see your name. They don't see your birth date. 
all that other information that could be pertaining to your checking account information. Oh, I need to see your driver's license and stuff like that if you write a check or your credit card information. I need to see a valid driver's license, right? So as, as technology evolved and different kind of digital money came in with credit cards and stuff, we had to have a way to verify you are who you are saying you are, right? We're here. Unfortunately, if you lose your password for your Bitcoin wallet, you're kind of at a loss and you lost that money. Yes. What happens if a bomb drops on one of these computer parts in the blockchain? So the question is, what happens if a, a natural disaster of some sort, some kind of disaster happens at uh, a server farm? Well, that's one of the things. This is a global network. It's not just a single server farm. You have server farms. The chain is distributed to multiple computers. So it is global. So that, that one block that your data might be in is on multiple servers or computers across the globe. And there's a way of verifying that each block each computer talks to one another. This is a hash, it's called. My hash is blah, the string of numbers and letters. And if my hash doesn't line up with this other computers that says that it has that same block, if these don't line up and aren't equal to one another, someone's wrong. Someone's computations are wrong. You can't really block, you can't really break that chain. That's you can't break the chain. Nothing's going, in order for a block to be introduced into the blockchain, it has to be verified by the rest of all the computers. So it's a consensus over all the computer network. So that way the data, because the data is permanent, we don't want that bad data to get in there, right? So we want to make sure that it is rock solid as possible. And by having them all the computers in agreement that th these two blocks equal one another, fraud cannot happen because you could have something in Sweden, a server farm in Sweden, one in Chile, one here in the Pacific Northwest, they all equal one another. So if we fall off the continental United States, let's say the West Coast falls off, you still have Chile and Sweden, right? You still have all these other data centers around the world to have the exact same data, these exact same blockchains across the globe. You have multiple connections among those computers. Correct. Correct, yes. There's no, it's decentralized. The computer network is decentralized, meaning multiple. The last thing I want to talk about here is kind of the supply and demand type of market. That is what Bitcoin is. It is a scarcity, a commodity, you could say, because it has a cap. There's only 21 million Bitcoins in the world. There's no government agency that could ever print more Bitcoins. Yakamoto cannot even go in and do it him themselves if they want. You know, like it is set at 21 million. That's the only number that you can get to. No one can make any more. So by that, it is a valued by the market demand, meaning if more people get interested in it, like Elon Musk buying 1.5 million billion dollars. Sorry, it's a billion, not a million billion dollars worth of bitcoins shot it up because all of a sudden the demand was high right i mean the dude was like hey just give me all your bitcoins i think i don't know how many he got an actual number of bitcoins but the dollar amount was 1.5 billion dollars worth of bitcoins so <clears throat> all of that is on the market supply and demand <clears throat> On the last slide here, just kind of the conclusion, the future, I wanted to talk about, you know, like Bitcoin. It's the technology that has the potential to, you know, really change the way we look at 
goods and processes of currency and really the establishment of governments. Like, are our governments here to tax us? And are they just money hungry people that are billionaires that just want to sit there and say they do things and just get taxes from us, right? I don't think that's true. Some people do believe that. <clears throat> but is this another way of allowing the future generations of us to move forward without having restraints upon, you know, government and geopolitical, you know, like some crazy Putin starts a war in Ukraine. Like who would have thought of that, right? The ruble went shot down, right? Like we put tariffs all on them. The like the, all of a sudden the Russian money went through the through the floor. And you know, I, I know a lot of Russian colleagues at the time were already invested in Bitcoin <laughs> and they strengthened their Bitcoin investments before the Ukrainian war because they knew it was coming, unfortunately, in Russia. And now they're fully invested in Bitcoin, all these independent people. Uh, I think I believe it's in Nigeria right now. They have uh, a banking crisis where or is it Algeria, Nigeria or Algeria? An African country right now is going through a uh, crisis of sorts. And so people, taxi drivers, they accept Bitcoin now because they don't trust the government fiat currency. You give me that dollar today, that dollar could be worth 50 cents tomorrow because the government decided to take everyone's money away from them in their bank. So I don't mean to scare everyone, but that's the world we live in right now in terms of countries that have, you know, their fiat money and the crashes that they go through with the geopolitical instances. Yes. You talked about uh, any competition to uh, other, other cryptocurrencies. So I was going to go into other cryptocurrencies, but this is not a financial session. I do not want to talk about, you know, the the ebbs and flows of, oh, you should purchase this cryptocurrency compared to that. That's not what this is about. So talk to a financial, your financial advisor in terms of how you want to diversify and stuff. I can tell you what I do is... I was unfortunate I didn't get to invest back in 2013 when I wanted to. But now I am. <clears throat> I have not stocks, but I have Bitcoin resources available to me if I need it, meaning credit cards that are backed by the Bitcoin uh, infrastructure. Uh, a big one out there right now, they just had a Super Bowl at their stadium, the SoFi Stadium down in Los Angeles. SoFi, from what I understand, is their credit cards are backed by the Bitcoin crypto and current currency. Um, so they use it more as a gold standard now. I believe that's what Elon Musk is doing, too. He stockpiled all those Bitcoins for a reason. I mean... <clears throat> I, I think that, you know, that Bitcoin will become sooner or later the kind of gold standard of currencies that will be interoperable between countries. You go from here to South Africa, I could bring my Bitcoin wallet and do my purchases still. No exchange rates changes. I don't have to worry about some bank, you know, taking, you know, a quarter of my money just to exchange my money, right? I mean, that's kind of ridiculous. We're trying to get over to a utopian type of banking style. I see Kenji, there's a question. What is meant by uh, fractional or fractal banking? So fractal banking is a style of banking. So I deposit $100 into my bank account that banking institution can then turn around and loan that money out to other individuals. They're on the hook for 
ten percent of it, I believe, ish. So the each bank, each banking institutions have their own thresholds, and I believe the typical ones about ten to twenty percent that any individual can pull out above a hundred thousand dollars. The FDIC actual insurance. So, like I said, if you have five million dollars in there and you want to pull all $5 million out there, they don't have to give you all $500 million or $5 million right now. They're only on the hook for 10 or 20%, whatever it is that you sign when you actually created your account with that banking institution. All that small print in the bottom, if you read it, has that information in there saying, hey, you try and take all your money out of here, you're only getting 10% right away or whatever their percentage is. That's fractal banking is you give me money, I'm going to loan it out to some other people. And because I'm loaning it out, I really don't have all your money still, right? So, and I'm making money off of the money you gave me on top of it. So, it, it that's fractal banking in a nutshell. I don't want to get too much into more details of it, but that's what my understanding of it is. Do you have another question? Is a Bitcoin ID like a Swiss bank account number? Very correct. Yes. That is, uh, is a Bitcoin ID like a Swiss bank account or a Cayman Island bank account ID? Yes. It is very much so. It is very important if you invest in Bitcoin that you maintain that number. Because, like I said, you are person XYZ123 when you're doing those transactions with Bitcoin. So if you lose that ID, you're no longer that, you know, 123XYZ user anymore. You lose your Bitcoin, unfortunately. So there are caveats to using Bitcoin in terms of forgetting passwords and for losing your digital wallet that sort of thing can really be a huge blow and risk that people are not willing to take and i fully understand why because i had those same feelings when i first got it hence why i have my reserves in a different sort of way i use banking institutions that are backed by bitcoin not a not a fiat currency or a gold standard or anything like that. It's not backed by any kind of commodity or the scarcity is the Bitcoin that it's backed. Oh, one more. Yes. Um, yeah, approximately how much did Elon Musk lose with the Bitcoin value falling or when it fell that career you showed us earlier? So he actually made money. He didn't lose any money. So if you look at my graph, let me get back to it. So as you can see here, back in 2001, this peak right here is where Eli, Elon Musk did the purchasing. Down here is where he said he no longer wants to take it for Tesla. Here is the actual all-time high that it hit back in November 2021, which was at 65-ish or above. I forget exact numbers. But when he bought it, it was down here at the 63, right? So you can see he, yes, technically lost a bunch of money here, but then gained it all back up and lost. And I mean, in Elon Musk's size, a couple of billion dollars probably is like pocket change to us, right? So <laughs> for him, I don't think he's struggling from the losses by any means. But yeah, he probably has lost some but I don't know if he sold some during the upturn up here to maintain that $1.5 billion, because as it comes and goes, I mean, might as well sell some off if it's just gonna jump back up, right? It's playing the stock market. If you've ever played the stock market, it's very similar to that. Well, I wanna say thank you for everyone for coming. Um, we have, oh, well, there we go. A few minutes left. If you guys want to hang out and discuss anything else, we'll be more than happy to chat with you. Otherwise, yeah, go enjoy your afternoon. <laughs>